thanks to our leader, Cindy Quarles, back there for, uh, for her leadership and helping us with the speeches and everything. I think she does a great job. And uh, also, I have my man Marcus here videoing the uh, speech. So I'm going to plan on posting this online. So I just want to say hi to my online audience. <laughs> uh, we got the live streaming set up next time. It's in the works, OK? So uh, thanks for anybody that's watching. So. <laughs> I gotta tell you guys though, this is one of the first times I think I can actually say I'm actually genuinely excited to give a speech. Um, you know, um, doesn't mean I'm not nervous, but um, I actually majored in communications in college and I gave a lot of speeches and like probably most of you guys, you know, just dreaded them and waited till the last minute and stuff. But, you know, I really believe God has shown me some, some good stuff here through our study and, uh, you know, stuff that I could have never came up with myself. and. I think it will really bless you guys. Amen. So, uh, without further ado, my scripture that I picked was Mark 15, 34. And that says, in the King James Version, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. Now, this is the same scripture is actually in Luke, just so you guys know. But the reason why I picked the one in Mark is because as part of our study, we had to actually read the whole uh, book of the verse that we picked in one sitting, and Mark is a lot shorter than Luke, so that's <laughs> why I picked Mark instead of Luke, in case anybody was wondering. But, uh, so let me just ask you guys, if you can recall a time when you felt like God had forsaken you, you know, I, I think we can all relate to that, where we, we go through times where we kind of say, God, where are you at here, and we think that he's turned his back on us, you know. Um, I know, for me personally, I had, uh, can recall a time when I was coming back from uh, Detroit to Chicago after the holidays. That's where I'm from, is Detroit. And uh, it was snowing out and the roads were slippery and my, my tires weren't the best and stuff. And so I ended up actually spinning out on the freeway. Yeah. And you know, you can only imagine the helplessness that you, you feel at that point. Now, thankfully, I, uh, I ended up fine on the side of the road and hit anybody. There's no damage to my car. But you know, after I gathered myself and, and got back on the road, I heard God say to me, son, I had you in the palm of my hand the whole time. Wow. So that was, you know, you come in, that was very reassuring, mm -hmm. you know? And so whenever I go through tough times, I still go back to that and remember that. And that lets me know, you know, God is with me. He's not, he's not left me. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go through a time like that to know that God won't forsake or an experience like that. You can learn it from the scriptures and, and you know, hopefully it's part of what I can do here for you guys today. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, kind of the two main points that I want to share with you guys are just about the faithfulness of God and how we can find hope in the Father the same way that Jesus did on the cross as well. All right. All right. And, you know, one of my favorite preachers right now is Greg Henry. Um, and he says, you know, he knows he's heard a good message when somebody shows him Jesus. And so that's what I'm going to try to do here as well. And shout out to Greg in case he is uh, watching. Love you, man. Um, <laughs> if anybody, if you guys are interested in learning more about grace, I would highly recommend him. He is an absolutely awesome, awesome grace preacher. And uh, his website is gospelrevolutionchurch.com. In case anybody wants to check him out. All right, so... First thing that I think we need to do here, or I should say probably the key to understanding this verse, in my opinion, is how we define forsaken. All right. You know, usually there's, well, I think it's important that we let scripture interpret scripture whenever possible. You know, but usually there's a way that the world thinks about it, and then the way that the scriptures say it could be different. You know, mm -hmm. like, for example, love. You know, there's a certain way that I think the world thinks about love, but then there's a certain way that 1 Corinthians 13 describes love. You know? So, now I didn't find any direct definitions of forsaken uh, in the Bible, but I did find a good parable that I felt gave a biblical perspective of what it means to be forsaken, and that's the parable of the prodigal son. All right. Now, I know most of my fellow CBC students here are probably very familiar with the story, but in case anybody watching online is not familiar, or just as a refresher for you guys, you know, you have a son who goes to his father and ask for his inheritance and you know he goes and lives riotously and squanders his inheritance and then you know um, you see him kind of envying the food of the pigs that he's watching and eventually going back to his father so that's just a quick overview of it 
But so hold that thought, and then I just wanted to find sin as well, because I think that's important going forward. I think a lot of times we get it mixed up where we think sin is, you know, the, the, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, those kind of things that we do. But sin is actually defined as a noun. Uh, as sin is actually a noun in the Bible. So it's actually unbelief is actually what is sin. Amen. That's right. Um, believing in your flesh True. to earn your righteousness with God. True. Okay, so those actions are just a result of your belief system. Mm. Okay. So keep that in mind as we go on. Um, so I would submit to you that the son was actually living in sin before he went out and started living righteously. That was just a result of his belief system right. he already had. Right. Amen. So, and think about how the father must have felt here, okay? You know, here you have your son, your own son coming to you and saying, basically, I wish you were dead. And, you know, I don't need you. Just give me my money. Wow. <laughs> I don't think I would have wow. given you money. But, so, you know, that's the point where the father forsakes the son, okay? But I think it's important to see what he was actually doing when he was forsaking him, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so what I believe he was saying was, listen, you know, if you want to go and believe in the flesh and you want to go and do that, you have free will to do that. You can go and do that. Mm -hmm. But his intent in doing this was to have him see how miserable <clears throat> that life was right. and have him come back to him right. and receive life. Mm. Okay? It doesn't mean that he turned his back on him. Right. Okay? Right. Right. Because when you see the son coming back, what do you see? The, you know, the Bible makes it a point to say, the father saw him from, yes. from a distance. He was there watching for him. Yeah. Right. You know? And what happens when he sees him? He comes, he hugs him, kisses him, yeah. puts the robe on him, throws the party for him, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's not like he was mad at him, right? It's not that he turned his back on him. He just let him go and do what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, I lost where I was at. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I mean, that's an important difference, I think, from the way that we usually think about it and, and what I think actually happened here. Okay? So... Going to Jesus on the cross, you know, nobody took his life from him. He says he laid down his life for the sheep, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't murdered. Um, the father didn't force him to do this. This is what he wanted to do, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Now, he knew that the wages of sin were death, and he knew that he had to die our death away. That's kind of what he wanted to do there. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so now if you go back and you look at the father of the prodigal son, and when he forsook him and when the son goes and lives this way over here and is miserable, I don't think that's that's really what he wanted. He didn't want him to be miserable, but he wanted the result of what would happen from him living that miserable life and coming back to him. Yeah. So that was his intent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus, or when God forsook Jesus, I think that's what kind of it's saying there is he's, he's saying he let him go to the cross because that's what he wanted to do was die our death away. That's part of what was happening there. Mm -hmm. And again, it didn't require the father to turn his back on him. So that's an important difference, and I think that's the main point that I'm trying to make there. Oh, All right? Amen. Amen. So um, now I think it's important to look at, so what was so important that the father let the son go and suffer like this? Okay? And in my opinion, it was he desired unhindered relationship with us. Okay? And that sin was what was hindering our relationship with him, okay? So whenever we think about our relationship with God, we have to put in the context of we're his children, okay? And so I think a good example of this is, I'm not, I don't have any kids myself, but for all you mothers and fathers out there, if you can think about like, if your kid is sick, are you mad at your kid for being sick? Or are you mad at that sickness or that disease? Right, right. You're mad at that sickness, right? Amen. So when you think about this, what Jesus did on the cross and what God was doing here, he was mad at that sin that was killing us. He wasn't mad at us. Right. Okay. So that's what was hindering us. That's what he was trying to get rid of. So go back to the prodigal son story now. The, the son returns to the father, and what do you see happening? You know, the father and son relationship is no longer hindered by him thinking that he can live a better life without the father. Sin. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that's removed. You see mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So that's something cool. That's just what God showed me, I feel like. And so hopefully I communicated it at least partly effectively. <laughs> but it's kind of it's a difficult thing, you know, um, to describe. But 
So again, you know, I don't think it was God who was mad at us. It was he was trying to kill what was killing us and get rid of that hindrance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, when you understand that, it, it allows you to see God better, I think, and it allows you to have more confidence when you're going through tough times or when you mess up, like we all do, you can still have confidence that God hasn't turned his back on you. Yeah. Because that's what we think, right? We're like, oh, God must have forsaken me. Where is he at? But that's not the case. That's just how we feel. So we have to, you know, part of being spiritually mature is going by what you know, not just by what you feel, right? All right. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So where am I at here? Um, okay, a few more things to think about. When Adam and Eve originally sinned, what do you see God doing? Did he just say, peace, I'm out, I can't deal no. with you guys anymore? No. <laughs> he came, and he, and he still was seeking after Adam, and he still, you see him clothing them and mm -hmm. taking care of them. Mm -hmm. um, think about yourselves before you were saved. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I wasn't living a holy life. You know, and uh, God was still pursuing me. Amen. Amen. And still persuading Amen. me of his goodness towards me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, if you don't get anything else from this speech, hopefully you guys get that. But there are a few other things that I'll move on to. Because um, there's, there's a lot of cool things going on here. And that's just the cool thing about the word is, you know, there's just so many layers and it's just so deep. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I don't have time to really elaborate on all of this. And I'll probably go over a little bit, so I'm sorry, but it's just too good. i got to tell you guys. <laughs> so um, so what, another thing, you know, it lets us see what Jesus is feeling when, it, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It lets you see we have a God that can relate to us. You know, when we're going through stuff like that, he can say, I feel you. I hear you. I've been through that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so that's that's just a cool thing that I think think about. Um, but also, it's another confirmation of him being the Messiah, mm -hmm. because you look at Psalm 22 as a prophetic psalm about the cross, mm -hmm. and that first uh, verse there says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" <clears throat> so I'll get into that in just a little bit. But another thing that's happening here is I think is by him saying this, he's pointing the Pharisees back to the entire Psalm 22. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my next point that I want to get into is when you look at the context, the scriptures before this, the Pharisees are sitting there and they're mocking him. They're saying, okay, you know, where is his God now? Truly, this is the forsaken of God. Um, and so the Pharisees were people who knew the scriptures very well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they had the scriptures on their arms and their hats <laughs> and whatnot. And, you know, they didn't have the distractions that we do today of radio and TV. I mean, these guys are just in the Word. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean they understood it, but they knew it. <laughs> um, this, so the way that I see this is it's kind of like how we memorize popular songs today. You know, like, for example, if I were to say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, it jogs your memory, and mm -hmm. you can kind of see what, you know, remember what the rest of that song is saying. And so that's how I kind of see this happening with the Pharisees. Jesus there, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then they start thinking, oh, verse 2, verse 3. And I don't have time to read the whole thing right now, but, you know, I can just see a light going on for them. And, and so just some of the things that Psalm 22 talks about, it talks about the Pharisees there mocking him. It talks about the Roman soldiers throwing the dice for his clothes. It talks about them piercing his hands and feet. So, you know, you start putting all this together and you go back to the first verse, which says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you see, and you know, I'm thinking that the Pharisees are sitting there seeing, this is exactly what this psalm is talking about. <laughs> mm. So, I, like I said, I got to believe that some of them, the light was going on for them about what was really going on, what was really happening. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the first time that Jesus did something like this. Um, if you remember, uh, John the Baptist uh, asked his disciples to go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one that we're looking for, or should we look for another? And what does Jesus say? He says, go tell them that the blind see and the mm -hmm. deaf hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, <laughs> you know, the first time I read it, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like, couldn't you just say a simple yes or no? <laughs> you, <talking about? laughs> you know, but what he was doing yeah. was pointing John back pointing to the, the scriptures that he knew so oh, well yeah. in Isaiah 35. Yes. That say, mm -hmm. when the Messiah comes, you will see the deaf hear and the blind That's right. yes. see. Exactly. Okay, and so, um, yeah, that's another cool thing that, just to think about. But if you end up reading the rest of the Psalm 22, not the end, but.